Hello. Hello. If people could sit down and get ready, we're about to do our next panel. Uh, so let's say we'll start in 30 seconds to give people time to sit down. It's getting quiet, so I think that's my cue. Thanks very much, everybody, for our next panel discussion. Uh, my name is Conan Nolan. I, uh, I'm a television guy, which is why I got the podium out of the way, so that they could see me uh, better over here. <laughs> the, the most dangerous real estate in America is the part between the camera lens and my face, <laughs> which is what... So anyhow, I'm delighted to be here. It's a privilege to be part of this. It's, uh, I love what uh, Bob and Mike have done here. Um, Dornsife, congratulations for putting this together. There's no better time for you to invest in this kind of dialogue, it would seem to me. So once again, uh, thanks uh, for coming, and uh, thanks for asking me back. I think, I think they do it because I'm an old guy and I'm still employed, so he, 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 can't, he can't be too bad. The panel here is terrific. I'm fans of all of them. Uh, to my far right, uh, Jim Brulte is the only person in the history of the state of California to have been made the Republican Assembly Leader and the State Senate, uh, uh, Senate Leader uh, his freshman year, both times. Uh, he's also considered to be, uh, he will dispute this, but the nicest guy in the history of Sacramento politics. He used, was the former chairman of the California Republican Party. God bless him for that job. Uh, he's now in private, uh, private practice. Carla Maranucci with Politico formerly with the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, she is, uh, I won't, you know, you're teasing when you say, well, she's a senior political reporter. We don't want to use that term. I know <laughs> they're using it for me. So she is, she's the one to read the California playbook every morning. That's your drop. That's how you get your day started. Um, and it's, um, it's a terrific way to, to get in touch with the nation's most popular state and the political dynamics here on a daily basis. Bill Carrick, he's had a couple of clients uh, as a political strategist. Um, Bill Clinton, Ted Kennedy, uh, uh, Diane Feinstein certainly uh, got her reelected again. Uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti, who um, well, well, I might ask him whether or not he's uh, happy that he's no longer in this field, or uh, you know who knows. Um, and Marielle Garza is with the Los Angeles Times on the editorial page. She's also was the, with the editorial page of the Sacramento Bee. She knows something about politics uh, there and here, uh, and. Um, I think this is going to be a fun conversation. But very quickly, I'm going to start with the strategists first. We were talking earlier about, yeah, California has a March 3rd primary. Great. You know, we've moved it up from June. What are the chances, though, because we still have four states beforehand, and there's this, there's this sense that, that there's going to be rocket fuel for one candidate, and all of a sudden you're going to have a very, in terms of viable candidates, you're going to have very few by the time this primary hits. But there's a chance that might not be the case. Uh, you know, uh, you could still have, it would seem to me, four viable candidates, then two billionaires. You could have, you could have upwards of six still in this race uh, with the possibility of picking up 15% in one of these congressional districts. Do I have that right? This is like the Phil Donahue show. You have to pull, you have to use a mic here. Uh, I think the possibility is out there. I don't know how high it is. I mean, I, I think there are four of them that are going to be still pretty well financed as they get through the first four primaries because of the uh, phenomena of on online fundraising. Uh, it's not like the old days, you know, when you, you ran out of money, you went home. R right, but isn't that, that, in that, I mean, the, you know, we have just uninterested he here, the mother's milk of politics is money. Isn't that the, the key here? You've got the financing, why would well, you drop well, out beforehand? Uh, let's just start. You know, the first four states, they're spending everything they have right now. There's no question about it. Every, everybody except Mike Bloomberg, who will never spend everything he has, so he do, he's not qualified. But everybody else is spending everything they got right now. So they're going to end up, now remember, South Carolina is the Saturday before Super Tuesday. So this is like a, in essence, uh, in terms of the calendar, this is a three-day campaign in the big states so they got to be a player you got to have enough money to be on the air digital broadcast cable the whole nine yards to, to be a player or you have to have a significant 
momentum that's carrying you over the, uh, the top. But the, there's so many states on Super Tuesday, it's unbelievable. It's not, and it's, you know, you want me to pull out my cheat sheet? No, there are, what, 10 of them. Yeah, yeah. and they are. Texas and is one. And, and they're not, there's uh, us and Texas are two mega states. Virginia and North Carolina are two really, b and Massachusetts are really big states. And then there's a whole, and Tennessee is a large state. Then there's a whole collection of Colorado and Utah and Oklahoma. And so the, the it's a big, big uh, day with a lot, and I think it's a, it's a transitional point. The first four are about winning or doing very well. And however that gets defined is uh, always debatable, but that, that the first four are about winning a primary or two or three or four. When you get to Super Tuesday, uh, all our friends in the media, they flip the switch and it becomes about the delegate count. So what is gonna matter is who wins and loses matters, of course, in some degree, but we're also gonna have a count uh, at the end of that day, it's going to say this one's ahead by this many delegates, that one's second, that one's third. This looks like they're, you know, way behind and they can't catch up. It's going to, it turns into a delegate count numerical evaluation right there before our eyes on election night on March 3rd. And I think we went through this one other time. As everybody knows, we've had a you know, up and down version of what California is, when it is, and what, what kind of uh, process it is. We had very similar to this in 2008. Uh, uh, Joel, somewhere around here, where is it? Joel remembers from the Obama campaign, the decision of the hierarchy was, we're not gonna spend all our money in California and have nothing left for the rest of the country. So uh, what we did is basically a very targeted campaign here, uh, trying to find out, look at in all the most favorable congressional districts and trying to figure out some way to play in them. So Senator Kennedy, he is, you probably remember, and endorsed Obama. He came here and campaigned in African-American community, in the Latino community, uh, in the urban areas. Uh, we had a big, huge rally at UCLA with um, uh, Oprah Winfrey and, and Michelle Obama, uh, and, and it, there was a, we did a lot of different things, but we didn't spend a hell of a lot of money here. Uh, and Hillary Clinton at one California, and she had, you know, a double-digit delegate advantage. But there's so, but it it, it didn't matter because there's so damn many delegates here that we we got a big chunk of them. There's this time there's 419 delegates in California. All right, Carla? Well, yeah, as, as, as Bill said, yeah, the media focus uh, turns to the number of delegates. And yeah, we're the 800 pound gorilla on Super Tuesday. It's 495 delegates, that's 10 times the number of Iowa. And the ballots go out in California on February 3rd. That's the same day that Iowa starts voting. And as we know, Californians like to vote by mail. So by the time uh, South Carolina comes around, 40% of the people in California will have cast ballots. Uh, that's, that's uh, you know, right, we've got 7 million Democrats who are gonna get ballots, 15 million all, all together, 7 million Dems, uh, 4 million Republicans, and the rest are these uh, decline to state or no party preference voters who can go Democratic and 75% of them uh, may just do that. R right, they have a, they have a uh, a hoop to go through, that's right. which we're going to get to and in a And that's the question. Will they do it? Will they take the time to uh, request a Democratic right. ballot? Just how many will be pissed off on Election Day when they find out <laughs> that they can't? Uh, but, but to that degree, so it's 50 percent by congressional district, 53 congressional districts in California. Currently, we may lose one. Uh, but is there any evidence that a campaign comes in takes a look at their demographic and realizes, I can't run statewide, and I know that there's it's a huge money commitment, so I'm gonna target, um, I'm gonna target a couple of Republican, you know, the California 48th or, or the 28th, or there's some way for me to reach that threshold. Is there any evidence we're seeing that? Well, uh, th there's not really any evidence anybody's got a ground game here. Uh, uh, one is the doing more for the, uh, um, reduce their unemployment rate is Bloomberg, but I, I, th the, there is not uh, any real evidence of a ground game. That doesn't mean they're not gonna 
try to gin it up. But the irony is, the, uh, as Jim knows, the irony is the, the most uh, red districts have some of the most progressive Democratic voters. I mean, even though they're, they're not a majority uh, of the, the district, the, the significant number of them. So, the, you know, like Tom McClintock's district has very, very progressive voters in it who are Democrats. They just have a hell of a lot more Republicans. So, that, you know, there's, there's that irony. And then there's the other irony, as we all say, L.A., San Francisco, the Bay Area is very liberal, blah, blah, blah. But, that's, but it's also where all the moderates live. Right. So, Jim Brulte, if K the Democratic Party went back, we, get, we, we, we got the lesson in the last, which is fascinating, about the Jesse Jackson rule. But there was a time not too long ago when it was winner take all on the Democratic side. If you won this state, just like the Electoral College, you won everything. Um, one could argue, as with the Republican delegation, uh, it would make a bigger splash. I, I mean, if you win this state, you get all 400. Well, we used to have winner take all on the Republican side. We now have winner take all by congressional district on the Republican side. So for example, in uh, 2008, I believe Mitt Romney picked up 15 delegates. Um, I think he won five congressional district. McCain got all the rest. Had winner take all by congressional district been in place in 2000, uh, McCain would have won one congressional district in the Bay Area. But the fact of the matter is, by and large, uh, at least on the Republican side, historically it's been over before we got here. The last time California mattered significantly in a Republican primary was 2000, where John McCain said if he won, he'd stay in. He ended up losing to George W. Bush. Democrats have, you know, they were huge in 2008 here. You know, we saw a decline in Democrat registration and Republican registration. 2008, Obama. Hillary primary Democrat registration popped up two whole points. And we saw the same thing in 16 with the primary. So um, the California Republican delegation is the largest delegation at the national convention. And it's actually the most democratic. And when I mean democratic, uh, I don't know how it is on the other side, but a lot of states on the Republican side, you can win and the state party picks delegates who hate you. Um, in California, the candidates actually get to pick their delegates, so we get delegates here. Yeah, we have a national more rule that the candidate has the right to approve their delegates. So we've sort of gotten rid of the, uh, you know, faithless uh, delegate. <laughs> the, uh, Mary L. D., um, this is a party that prides itself on diversity, on bringing people from all walks of life. Uh, it's part of the Obama coalition that we saw that got him elected. And yet, you are staking so much rocket fuel in this primary on states that are predominantly white, very small, and rural. At what point does the Democratic Party step in and say, Iowa and New Hampshire no longer should be the arbiters as to who's going to be at the top of the Democratic ticket? That's a good question. And in fact, that conversation, to a certain extent, has already begun. Julian Castro talked a little bit about that. Uh, and it's true, uh, Iowa, New Hampshire, um, and to a certain degree, um, North Carolina, although Nevada is getting, has gotten a lot more diverse, at least in terms of Latinos. Um, yeah, it's kind of an archaic system. Uh, it still works, I think it works. Um, the, the, the fact that tiny little states have so much power to decide who is the candidate that represents everybody, um, and I understand the way it's set up, at least. I don't know if it's intentional, but it does. You don't want to have states like California and, and Texas always dominating the, the discussion about who's the candidate. But you also don't want to have the uh, tiny little states that, are, that don't represent the rest of the country doing it either. So I don't know how you get there from here, but it's really a discussion the Democratic Party should have. <laughs> you know, the part of the problem that we're now, we, we are having an argument about this because of the, of the lack of diversity in, the, in Iowa and New Hampshire. Part of the remedy was adding to the early part of the calendar Nevada and South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was uh, theoretically, they were more diverse, more minorities, and also, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the other thing, Iowa and New Hampshire don't have huge labor movements either. So 
the Nevada was supposed to supply a little of that. So that that was the the solution. Now it may not be, it may not have worked, but the 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 original disease in this is the parties are trying to control the calendar, and in the ba back in the old days it was like they kept moving Iowa and New Hampshire earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier. Now they're in February, but Bob and I have spent uh, some cold uh, January nights in the Iowa caucuses. I mean, that they, they was just moving early and earlier. So this is like, a, this is a, trying to police the calendar is how this all got set up so that states wouldn't just keep going earlier and earlier and earlier. I mean, you know, historically, we know that uh, Robert Kennedy announced in March of the primaries season that he actually ran in in 68. I mean, the, the, this, this all started much later. And this was to prevent it from getting even earlier and earlier, even going into the year before. So that's, that's the origin of it. Now, maybe there's another solution to the problem that is beyond having Iowa and New Hampshire up front, but right. so far I, we haven't found it. I, I remember spending New Year's uh, in Des Moines. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not, I can't remember which election that was. I was there, yes, was I remember. <laughs> yeah. Conan, I wanted to go back to something you said about our candidates um, campaigning here statewide. Uh, and I think you're seeing a recognition that this is really 53 different uh, elections here. And as you pointed out, uh, Bolte, uh, about 18 different major uh, uh, media 12, markets. 12, 13 different right. media markets. Like we have seen Bloomberg, for instance, come in last week alone. He went to Oakland. He went to Monterey. He went down south. He's picking up mayors in very specific areas, Stockton, San Jose, that Silicon Valley, Chula Vista. Um, these are specific ways in which uh, these candidates are trying to pick off delegates and delegate counts in different districts. Biden's people are doing the same. It's why Bernie Sanders went up to paradise uh, to, to campaign. He's done more rallies probably than anyone else in his state. So I think there's definitely, uh, Buttigieg went out to Fresno and did a town hall. That kind of stuff we haven't seen before. So we're seeing recognition uh, that they've got to pick up these delegates and the rule uh, that was mentioned in the last panel is important, the 15% rule. They know they've got to make that mark. Uh, and, you know, Joe Biden can get 15% uh, in one district and Bernie can get 14% in the same district and Biden's going to come away uh, with the lion's share of delegates there. So it is a, it is a battle for, that, for uh, those delegates in every congressional district. Jim, were you going to add to that? No, I just to put New Hampshire in perspective in 2004 when I was on the ballot to be reelected, I got almost twice as many votes as John McCain got in the primary in New Hampshire <laughs> uh, to win the New Hampshire primary. Right. Um, so it's ju it's just such a small. I, I have to state. remind people that uh, Pete Buttigieg is as, uh, is like the mayor of Burbank. Um, if, you, if you think about that, I mean, I'd, I'd like to ask Pete if he knows who the mayor of Burbank is because <laughs> they're similar cities in size. Um, the the uh, Amy Klobuchar, those are the candidates that are that are going to be hard pressed to get any kind of rocket fuel out of the first four states. It would seem to me, and Pete Buttigieg for that matter, because he is not doing, he's not pulling well in a state like South South Carolina, not pulling well in Nevada. And and to your point, Bill, those states were added because of organized labor. Yeah. I mean, the labor said we need a, we need some labor states up front. Yeah, that's why Nevada's up front, and uh, and the same is true of African Americans in South Carolina, which I, which roughly half the vote will be African American in South Carolina. Marielle, I have to ask you. David Brooks of the New York Times wrote a piece just the other day. I don't know if you read it, but it it, ex it extols the virtues of Joe Biden. Uh, it r recites the. Um, the chattering class on the on the coast saying, "Oh, he's too old." You called him your your grandfather's candidate, I believe, in one of your columns, uh, and um, and he says, "Oh, you, you know, he, 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 everybody wrote wrote off his obituary." Uh, he made the point that it's it's an example how how we are sort of out of touch because actually electability is a major issue within the Democratic uh, the Democratic campaign. We might not see it on Twitter. But most Democrats aren't on Twitter, uh, and they play an outsized role in this, this, this debate. It could be Joe Biden could run the table. He could. We just don't know. Um, but 
to the point about electability, I'd just like to point out that the electability as we've been using it in this election is such a coded word, I believe. And I think it means different things to different people. We've been using it, um, well, Joe Biden, he's more electable. Why exactly? Um, and I, a lot of people believe it means you're a older centrist um, male candidate, white male candidate. And um, well, um, to that to that point, right. um, today's I don't know how many out of curiosity, how many ever listened to the Daily, the New York Times podcast in the morning? Okay, I, I suggest you tune in today because their Times reporter went to Pennsylvania, talked to organized labor, uh, the pipe fitters, the the folks um, who are in the uh, who are in, into fracking, frankly, in the petroleum industry, and the and and then they went to an environmental group. And the uh, and the and the union folks said it's Joe Biden or nobody. We're not voting for Bernie. We're not voting for w Warren. And a couple said they won't vote for Trump, but a couple said they would vote for Trump because it's their livelihood. It's their it's. And then they went to the environmental group who said we hate Biden, we hate Buttigieg, but would we vote for him? Yeah, we would because of Donald Trump. And so if that says anything, then maybe it is about uh, electability. Is is not about who can get elected, it's about who's already in the office right now and the, and like the house is on fire mm -hmm. as far as Democrats are concerned and you can't debate, uh, you know, stepping on the rose bushes in order to get to the house in order to put it out. And yet, you see the point? Although I think there are very few Democrats who when it comes down to November are thinking, well, I don't know, Elizabeth Warren, she's pretty extreme, I'm gonna vote for Trump. I just don't think that's gonna happen. Well, well if, if you're, if you're, oh, Listen to that podcast because they'll say, "Listen, if you're into fracking, if you're into petroleum," right. and she says she wants to end it. That's a. It's easy to say in January. It's going to be a different, different question. Uh, electability is one of those things that's very poor. I mean, Ronald Reagan was the foul pole in right field in 1980, <laughs> and managed to get elected president of the United States. You know, people who I mean, Donald Trump was never going to be president, right? Mm -hmm. He was unelectable. I heard that again and again and again. And the last time I checked, he just got back from Davos. So um, <laughs> electability is a great argument to make when you don't have the passion of the base. Um, but base voters tend to like base candidates. Uh, well, I, I, think, I think that this, the, the Trump is, of course, the elephant in the room. So everybody, the, the, what voters mean by electability is not all these, you know, theories about it it's they mean who can beat trump and they logically conclude that they think uh vice president biden is the best equipped to beat trump that's and that has nothing to do with all these other things and i i know there's anxiety that we are the, the most diverse political party but where our leadership is not that diverse I, I get all that, but I think for most voters, they start from one frame of reference. Who can beat Trump? Now, uh, that's just all there is to it. And I've been through, I've been through all kinds of uh, over-dinner therapy, over-drinks therapy with people. <laughs> and, and constantly, they get to the, they sort of slowly evolve. I really love Pete, blah, blah, blah. That was in October. I'm really worried about him. You know, they, he can't get any African American votes. I may have to vote for Biden. That's the way. That's the way electability actually works. Is people just decide that, hey, that's the one that can beat Trump. Now they may be wrong. I mean, I, I take Jim's point. Reagan obviously was considered to be, you know, a, a right wing nutcase by most of the establishment. Uh, political media and o otherwise for many years. And he obviously got elected president of the United States <laughs> twice. If I learned anything from 2016, um, it was that everything, every assumption that I make is going to be wrong. So true. And oh, polls so don't predict the future. And electability and who can beat who is completely unknowable. This, this is why what was but, so interesting. But that, 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 I, I, I'm not arguing with that point. I'm saying that people make, a, that for in their world, they make a logical conclusion that the person who could win, most likely win, is Biden. 
that's it's a logic you know based on his experience and uh, in politics and and his widespread approval across the political spectrum. Carla? This, this is why it was so interesting to watch Bloomberg's campaign sweep last week through California. In Oakland, he got several hundred people. First of all, the money is so evident. I mean, you're, he's giving out shopping bags with I Like Mike and T-shirts. He's got a huge, you know, buffet free. I mean, it's like... Wait, he stuff. did this in San Francisco and yeah. not in L.A.? <laughs> yeah, he did. Um, but... Almost to a person, everybody I interviewed who came said, look, I've already donated to four or five candidates, but I, I want to hear this guy because he says he's going to put his money, no matter who the candidate is, behind the Democratic candidate. So I want to hear what he has to say. And comparing him to Steyer, uh, most people said, and he ran New York City pretty well. Uh, that, that was a factor for them, too. So people are listening to him. Uh, whether that's going to be a big factor or how much, but the fact that he is willing to stand behind whatever candidate seems to be attracting a lot of Democrats out there. And, 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 but getting back to electability, um, it's about electability in 10 counties in five states. It's not, it's not you know, remember, uh, most people probably know this, but Hillary Clinton won California by 4.3 million votes. If you took California out of the equation in 2016, Donald Trump actually won the popular vote. So you can get a candidate, here's the argument, you can get a candidate that inspires the base, so you win California not by 4.3, but 4.4 million votes. But if you lose, lose Erie County in Pennsylvania, Macomb County in Michigan, you have just lost the Electoral College. And you're looking at the possibility of this time winning the popular vote by 5 million and losing the Electoral College. So we talk about electability and we look at past campaigns. This is different. Well, one of the constants is that political insiders tend to get it wrong a lot. <laughs> you know, the Democrats in 1966 wanted to run against Ronald Reagan for governor because George Christopher, the mayor of San Francisco, would be more difficult to beat. I mean, my team wanted to run against Gray Davis in um, 1998 because we thought he'd be the easiest candidate to beat. He ended up winning by 20 points. So, you know, the, I, interesting, every assumption you made in 2016 was wrong. I, I've stopped making assumptions. That's actually why I prefer primaries, because I think average voters, average voters get it right a lot more often than political insiders give them credit for. And that's on both sides of the Your issue. primaries as opposed to caucuses? Uh, primaries as opposed to non-primaries, uh, caucuses. But, you know, I like... The more voters get to participate, I think the better it is. Um, no. You but take a California voter and you explain Iowa, and and your head will explode. The idea that you got a thousand precincts, and you go to these gymnasiums, and everybody comes in, and then you're supposed to close the door because you need to get the 15% level based on who's in the room. I remember talking to a uh, John Edwards guy from like on the flight back, and he says, yeah, we thought we had everybody, and then we found out the door was left open, and people were coming in from a different caucus, so we didn't have, and it was just, it's bizarre. And then, then you break up into groups, okay, who's for him, who's for him, who's, un who's undecided, okay, and then the campaigns make a pitch, and then they all can kind of commiserate, well, I don't like Biden because of his health care plan. Bring on the Biden guy with his health care book. And it's, it's just, it's an all-night affair, and it's bizarre. Well, so I, I, I was in Iowa in 1988 with Vice President Bush for 10 days. It's a, by the way, Iowa in December sucks. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, in the hotel I was staying, there were three presidential candidates doing events the same day. That's Iowa. Um, yeah. New well, Hampshire. You know, I mean, I'm going to speak up for Iowa. Because this is like ridiculous. The ethanol the, the, state. Here, here we are in downtown LA, trashing Iowans. Actually, they they are very serious people. They take this whole process extremely seriously. They think of themselves like the United Nations or something. They're taking. They're assuming a role for the whole world to figure out who would be the best president. They come. They go out and stand around in a in a gym or wherever else on a freezing cold night. Uh, for hours, uh, and and they go to rally. You know, 
There are more people go to rallies in Iowa than have been at a rally in California in the last 25 years. Yeah, but they don't get a chance here in California. That's the, that, that is the that, problem, isn't it? I mean, no, it's not the problem. No, I, that, I'm just saying. I'm just speaking up for Iowa. It's not. <laughs> it's not some, uh, you know, Machiavellian process that nobody understands. The Iowans understand it pretty damn well. I actually, I think Californians probably couldn't be bothered with anything so involved. That's not this. Uh, yeah, I agree with you about that. They're busy. We, they, I mean, even we've, the state has made it incredibly easy to vote. It's almost like people coming to your house and say, please vote. In fact, actually, uh, that's I, what I, we I, do. Yeah, and, uh, but still, people don't vote. Right. Yeah. The definition of a campaign rally in California are three people around a TV set <laughs> and <they> watching <laughs> commercials. <laughs> you got to credit Trump for did, that. Did, that, oh. that was Bob Shrum's <laughs> line. I, sorry. <laughs> But I you said that years ago, and I remembered it. 1986, he said it. So that's how old I am. But, but so, I um, by I, the I, way, we have caucuses here in California. How many people have been to their uh, party's caucus in some time or another? One, two, me, I've been. Jim's been. So that's four of us. <laughs> <laughs> right. So there's an extra cup of coffee for you outside. As I mean, that, that, that we do. So, so we pick the delegates here by caucus, and and, and you go and there, you know, there there's could be a hundred people, but they're actually representing, you know, half the world. You know, the half of Los Angeles or something. Well, by the way, we we pick our delegates by voting. The voters in each county get to pick our local elected. Central Committee. We don't do it by caucus. I, I will say, I'm going to speak up for California here because I do think, look, we are, we're a huge state. Um, we're 40 million people. Uh, you know, we're hundreds of miles of coastline. But I, when I've seen when you give people a chance to actually see these candidates up close, a lot of times, I mean, Elizabeth Warren came out to Oakland uh, uh, on, a, on a cold night uh, in the last year. She, you know, with one night's notice, she got something like 8,000 people that turned out to see her uh, at Laney College. That's the kind of thing, pe people w are kind of hungry for the chance, those who are involved in the process. So yeah, I agree, Iowa, uh, the Iowans are very involved. But th you know, the question is, look, these caucuses are held at a certain time, it involves three hours of uh, investment of time, what kind of voters can do that? Not seniors, not disabled people, yeah, seniors not a, a, a lot of working people. The, the, it'll, be a, it'll be much older than the yeah. actual population of the people. But, but a lot of working oh, it parents on or the working moms and dads, they, uh, they can't afford three hours on a winter night to, to hang out at a caucus. So I think that's where California's um, you know, role in this, I, I think a lot of people uh, think, uh, is important, but the voters could be more engaged or would be more engaged if given the opportunity. I think there's room for both California's model and Iowa's model, so long as they complement and not overpower each other. Right. Uh, uh, my own view about why California doesn't get any attention has nothing to do with who's early and who's late. We would got a hell of a lot of attention when we were the last first Tuesday in June when uh, the whole process was winner take all. And uh, we got rid, it was one of these grand reforms that backfired. We got rid of winner take all in the Democratic Party. And ever since then, California has had a de minimis role in yeah. the process. That's just the reality. If we were back, if we were on June 2nd of 2020 and it was winner take all for whatever it is, 495 delegates, you damn sure everybody would be camped out here. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. That's, I was hoping somebody would say that because um, I, I remember Bob. Bobby Kennedy, uh, you know, it's on to Chicago and let's win there. Hubert Humphrey. Rockefeller uh, and Goldwater uh, winner take all in 64, right? Right. I was eight. Right. You were eight. <laughs> let, let, let's talk a little bit about the, the I process. Was a little older. Um, I, so the Secretary of State, God bless him, uh, Alex Padilla, have rolled out this process for voting in California. It's going to be new. Uh, you can make the argument there's never a good time to start a new voting system, but we're starting it this time. Los Angeles County is exempt from the rest of the state. Uh, one out of every four ballots in the state cast here alone. Uh, remember there, you know, like the sheriff likes to say, or at least the previous sheriff likes to say, uh, more people vote in the race for, um, for sheriff of LA County than vote for governor in 42 states. So it's, it's a big deal. You were there when Dean Logan unveiled the new voting machine at these voting centers. It's not a machine, it's a, it's a tablet. Ballot marking machine, don't Ballot. say voting machine. Yeah, and so I, I look at it, God bless him for trying, but I can't imagine, I mean, I just, are you concerned? 
that there's going to be problems on Election Day? Well, I, I am, but not because of the, the changes in the voting system. Um, to be fair, this is, the, this is a second phase of a rollout of the Voter Choice Act, which um, the legislature passed some years ago, I can't remember exactly, um, that allowed counties to do early voting and to consolidate precincts and to vote, vote centers that were open, extended, e extended hours, to sort of reflect the way that people like to vote um, or are voting. Um, five counties tried it out, 2018, fairly successful, um, a slight increase in turnout, um, there weren't too many bumps. This year, uh, 10, more <coughs> 10 more counties are trying it out, including uh, the largest, um, LA, Orange County, Santa Clara, that's where San Jose is, um, and several others that I don't have time to mention here, because I only care about LA and Orange County. Um, at the same time, and. Uh, Dean Logan had been planning a modernization of LA counties, you know, the Inca vote thing that we do. Conca, conca. I mean, it's pretty old school. <laughs> and um, so it sort of coincided with this fairly important election. Plus, and here's where I think people are, and I know people are confused because I've heard from them. Um, 10 years ago, California changed its primary system to the top two or jungle primary for legislative races. <laughs> And uh, Californians love it. I don't know how successful it is. It depends on who you ask, but they love it. They can vote for any candidate. They don't have to be registered de Democrat to vote for Republican and vice versa. Um, and we have trained voters that this is the, what they should expect from um, primaries, except for presidential primaries when we go back to the closed primaries. And that's the case this year when um, if you're a uh, unaffiliated voter, if you don't you're not uh, registered with a party, you have to request a ballot uh, for the presidential uh, primary of the three that are open to you, which is Democrat, uh, Libertarian, and um, American Independent. And a lot of people are not getting that message. And it's very concerning to um, election officials who think that there's going to be a lot of chaos at the ballot. Now, there are some options. Uh, California now has uh, same-day registration. You can go to your you can go to your poll and say, "Oh, I want to vote for a Republican. Sign me up," and you'll get to you'll get to vote. Um, but there's sure to be a lot of chaos and probably a lot of people who will just not participate. Right, and remember the uh, if you're an older voter like myself and you're used to going to Joe Smith's garage or the Boy Scout place, that's gone. Mm -hmm. The good news is you get to start voting ten days. Um, what else? Oh, if you're a vote by uh, mail voter, you can start voting as soon as you get your ballot. Assuming you get it the day they goes out on February 3rd, you can vote then. Right, but there's a big risk. You vote early and somebody drops out or you find out they're a child molester, you want to pull your vote back. I'm sorry, you can't. That you is, voted for that person. That is true. That is true. <laughs> well, that, that happened here in 08 because John Edwards had dropped out and a whole bunch of people were trapped as Edwards voters and didn't have the opportunity to vote for the two uh, Senator Clinton and Senator Obama at the time. One of the downsides of early voting, I guess. Right. Uh, and, you know, I, I just, voting used to be, the, the, the architects of the system we used to have considered voting extremely important. So you swore people uh, by, uh, under the, on the Constitution as deputy registrars to take the ballots, go to a polling station, you kept your eye on them, you came in to vote, they gave it to you, you walk 10 feet away, you vote, you come back, you put it in the box, they're sworn uh, under affidavit to take it back to, to be counted. Now, we have a system where we throw them out through the mail. They're, they're, the custody of the ballot is gone away. It goes to your house, you got three people there, maybe grandma's there, there goes the secret ballot, because grandma's got her ballot on the table now, so anybody could go, well, no, my grandma, you wanna vote for Bernie, whatever, so that that's out of the way. At, at, and so, and then, you have millennials talk about uh, about going to um, y y you know the big box uh, realtors uh, 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 retailers are going south, but now instead of going to the neighborhood place where you commiserate with your neighbors, you go to a super vote center, super center. Just seems to be counterintuitive to the way people. But, but I, would say, I would say, Conan, that, that, that there are other changes that have been made. You know, when, you, when you vote by mail, I, I don't know how people do it in their house. I know in our house, we bring everybody together, even the neighbors, 
uh, a couple of weeks before, we all debate the issues. Everybody talks about them. It's maybe I think in a lot of cases it's uh, sort of a civic dialogue. Is what neighborhood do you live in? <laughs> it's like a mini caucus. I like it. I mean, it just it, Bob, it is they, what it uh, is. Bob, Bob and Mary Louise do that every election. They have, everybody in their building gets together and goes through the ballots. And I always call and find out how I'm doing after the, <laughs> they've had their Sunday brunch. Well, Let's talk a little bit about polling. We got a few minutes left, though, because it was brought up that the polls were wrong. I got it. Uh, from what Chuck Todd told me, that part of the the big problem with the polling was that pro-Trump Republicans were less likely to talk to a pollster, and you can um, you can adjust for that, but they didn't adjust for it properly, and that's why you had the Midwest was solidly blue, and perhaps Hillary believed that, which is why she never set foot in Wisconsin. They've made changes to that, but at the same time, um, I, I'm I, you know, the only poll is the one that that, show, that 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 you can count on on election day. But in Iowa, there could be an argument that if you have an older constituency that that votes for Biden, if you have a snowstorm, that could you know they don't have vote by now, mail, you know your your candidate and your campaign may be influenced simply by by the weather. Well, I, I, the question uh, about th this whole process is, I think most people go through go through this thinking that the, the uh, polling process is some kind of scientific thing that it has, you know, ac accuracy within a margin of error of four percent or something. Now there's all these different methodologies that are being used to conduct public polls. I'm not talking about private polls, public polls. And sometimes uh, some of them are robocalls and, and all kinds of things that just are, are not accurate. I mean, there's people polling for major newspapers in these er early four states, and I'm not talking about the Des Moines Register. They have a really good poll. But there's a, there are a bunch of polls that aren't very good at all. I mean, uh, unfortunately, I think every university that doesn't have a football team has a poll instead. R right, a but, but a Iowa is traditionally... That, a that is a problem. <laughs> I Iowa is traditionally a tough state to poll, correct? I mean, it's just... Well, caucuses are tougher than primaries, yeah, for sure. I remember talking to a pollster, uh, interviewing a pollster years ago who was concerned about how we were moving to uh, cell phones and how people interact with cell phones differently than their home phones. And it's a and it skews sort of the demographics of the poll the people who will um, uh, participate in polls, and I have got to assume that trend has only gotten weirder and worse and harder for pollsters as they try to navigate um, and reach voters of all sorts of age and 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 um, economic levels who are harder to track down. Well, pollsters like Joel figure out how to make these, you know, guard for all those kinds of things and make make uh, appropriate changes in order to get more accuracy. But you know that doesn't happen when somebody's doing a poll, a robo poll. Poll Cole tells you so and so's suddenly jumped forty two points in since last week. So Jim. Uh, 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 Former Vice President Biden made the point the other day that he'd be better for the down ballot on the Dem on the Democratic side than anybody else. You have lost every congressional seat in Orange County, uh, Harley Ruda, in a in a in a majority Republican district, I believe the 48th. Um, Katie Porter, what are the chances of those seats, in your opinion, because you know that area, flipping back? if they have a progressive candidate on the top that is exactly the kind that some of these, um, some of these middle of the road Republican suburban women um, can't vote for? Yeah, you know, it's hard to tell, first of all. Um, most of the, uh, first of all, the seven Democrats that won, all won in districts that Hillary Clinton won in 2016. So they were districts that had been trending I can make a case that had the Democrats really spent the kind of money in 16 that they did in 18, they would have picked up a number of those seats. I mean, Dana Rohrbacher, I think, was outspent two to one before Michael Bloomberg dropped $4 million on his head uh, two weeks out. 
Um, the Democrats ran as moderate Democrats. By and large, their record doesn't reflect that. And uh, a, a, an aggressive progressive at the top of the ticket probably hurts them. That said, Republicans have not picked up congressional seats in California in a presidential election since 1984, mm -hmm. when Ronald Reagan was the incumbent Republican president, when he was a Californian, and when he got 59% of the vote across the country. So as, as somebody that bleeds Republican blood, I'd like to say, you know, we got a great shot at a number of them. Um, as somebody who tends to be data-driven. Um, it's not looking good. I just think it's, <laughs> you can always turn history on its head. History doesn't always repeat itself. R right. But, but you, it does most of the time. You have six Republican members of Congress from California and one felon, so there's seven. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, in terms of your former party recruiting, I mean, what kind of Republican can win in these districts? Yeah, I, look, I think uh, McCarthy and company have done a very, very good job of recruiting in those districts. Um, uh, Mike Garcia, out in the district that Steve Knight uh, used to represent, a very, you know... This is the, the, the Katie Hill seat. The Katie Hill seat. Where George Papadopoulos is also running. Well, I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know that man. Um, <laughs> So, look, is it possible? I, I think they've done a really good job of recruiting, but you can't, I mean, the other question, you know, I always ask is if Republicans were in the majority and they allowed their candidates in California to be outspent three or four to one, how do Republicans in the minority flip that? And the answer, I'm still waiting for an answer. Uh, and the other thing, that uh, the last round of voter registration that uh, the Secretary of State reported, the change from uh, November in 2018 in registration in the uh, Steve Knight's old seat went Democrats are up 15,000 and Republicans are down 10, just in, in, the, in the time from November 2016 to December uh, uh, to 2018 to this December of 2019. So it, it, there's there's something going on here that's larger than the campaigns. Oh it's sure, a, it's Look, a big the, demographic and you know in 1996 change. Republican registration was 37 percent. Um, Republican registration has declined from 1996. And the decline in Republican registration in California parallels about the decline in the white population. Uh, you know, we, we lose track of it because, you know, we, we're so big. But California is one of five states that is a minority-majority state. Uh, the other four, Hawaii, overwhelmingly Democrat. New Mexico, overwhelmingly Democrat. Democrat governor, Democrat senators, two-thirds Democrats in the state Senate, I think two-thirds in the state assembly. Nevada, overwhelmingly Democrat. Interestingly enough, the other one is Texas. And notwithstanding the fact that Governor Abbott and every uh, statewide Republican won in 2018, in Texas, Republicans lost two congressional seats, two state Senate seats, and I believe 12 state assembly seats. So and, and the, the, the Democrats in striking district. You know, the, the you know, I wrote an op-ed once last year, I think, talking about, you know, you you all think California is an outlier, and it's not. We're the canary in the coal mine. And until Republicans across the country figure out how to get a significantly greater percentage of votes among people who are not white. Republicans are going to have trouble, given the demographic changes across the country. Let's take some questions here. Um, we've gone, yes, to... Um, oh, uh, thanks for the discussion. Uh, New York Times reported last night that Harris is strongly considering endorsing Biden. Wouldn't happen, they say, until after the impeachment trial, but she's considering it. Uh, if she does, you know, before California is finished voting, um, 
how how do you think that would impact his chances of winning California? I think it would. I mean, she's very well liked here. What what do you what do you guys think about that? Well, I mean, is she well liked? She wasn't polling very well in her home own home state. So true. What, what, what does any well, her any approval endorsement? rating among Democrats is very high? It's uh, uh, the, uh, the people that don't like her are Republicans and and uh, climate yeah. states. Yeah, I mean, an endorsement like this obviously she had a she had a donor base that that could be uh, important. She's got a uh, number of followers. I think it, it it would be important. She's getting attacked already on online um, uh, for you know is she really a progressive if she endorses Biden? But the fact is, a lot of people saw them as very close before uh, until she went on attack and that second debate which surprised a number of Democrats on how uh, uh, how she went after him on busing. Uh, and she lost some people there. Uh, right. I remember watching that. I was in Miami and thinking, okay, there goes the Veep. You know, yeah, that's she, what she people just, said. Right. Yeah, yeah, she burned a bridge, but apparently not. But that was then and this is now. Does, does any of it matter? Does Gavin Newsom, if he endorses, does uh, Dianne Feinstein will endorse, obviously, at Joe Biden. She's a friend. But th does any of that really matter, the endorsements? Well, it depends on what they do, right? What do they do do to help somebody? Do they raise money? Do they organize all that stuff? Do you think it helps? Well, as a as a professional endorser, that's what we do, endorsement. I have a theory about endorsements, and this is based on it's not scientific, um, but and that is that in local races, uh, state and state and and local government races, endorsements are very important because candidates don't know much about the the voters. We do judicial races. Does anybody know anything about the judges they vote for? Well, well, thank you, one person. Um, we do endorsements, and they're incredibly popular. Um, I don't think it's the same with presidential endorsements because people are so exposed. They have their own opinions. I know I've heard from everyone I know their strong opinions, and I'm sure you already have too. So if they hear Eric Garcetti just uh, endorsed um, uh, uh, Biden, thank you. It's not like, well, I was going to vote for Warren, but Eric Garcetti, boy, I'm going to, I'm going to change. <laughs> but I mean, that's that, that's in in terms of voters, it, it probably has a much bigger effect. Yeah, if the they lower the information, low information races, mm -hmm. endorsements are much more important, mm -hmm. um, and local races, ju judicial yeah. races. Presidential races are not low information races. That's a yeah, good and, point. and if Eric Garcetti goes out and campaigns as a surrogate or opens his Rolodex, all of those Hollywood donors he has, then then he helps the candidate. That's exactly. what Bob. Uh, some in, I was going to observe, by the way, that some endorsements matter a lot. Kennedy's endorsement for Obama. If Obama were to endorse right, in this presidential thing, it would it would uh, it would have a big impact. But the, I want to go back to the question of California and its prominence in the process. And I, I wonder if you guys would comment on the assumption that somehow or other California is going to have this massive effect when, in fact, all these other states are voting on the same day. They're voting in time zones where the polls close much earlier. So all of the reporting that night is going to be about what happened in all these other Super Tuesday states. There will probably be an exit poll here. But they won't even be able to release the exit poll or talk about it until 11 o'clock at night Eastern time or 12 o'clock, depending on when the last polls close here. So is it possible that somehow or other the assumption that California is going to have a huge impact on the race, especially, by the way, since it's not just 11 o'clock at night, it's going to take a week or two weeks that, to count all the ballots. That's a big deal. You're I mean, clear. it may be that we won't have the kind of impact people assume we will. I think based on the sheer numbers, I mean, California will have some role in, in winnowing this field down when we talk about the 15% issue and how the how that shakes out. But, Bob, you're absolutely right. Uh, based on what we know from the last couple of elections, it took a while, in some cases weeks, to figure out what the final vote was. So that's you have to be gonna be yeah, If it's postmarked by, the, by midnight the 3rd, Correct. It gets counted. It shows up days later. Exactly. It can take it can take up to a week for us to really have a good sense. That said, if there's a clear winner um, that night, and it's it is possible that there's somebody who just sweeps the state, that'll be a big deal. It it, it affects on the margins though. Late votes. I'm six. The last I checked, and I haven't been doing this for a year, but um, sixty nine percent of Republican 
voters vote absentee in the primary. Um, and so that number has been going up incrementally each election. So in this cycle, uh, we may have 72% of the Republicans and the Democrats aren't far behind. They, they're, they're, they're a little bit behind us. So, you know, that's a huge number. So the first flash results come out and most absentees are counted. Most absentees are counted on, on election day. There's some that straggle in late um, that really affect legislative districts and congressional, but, but not. The coverage that night when you have from, you have 10 states, we're gonna have results out of Texas long before uh, the polls close. And so it, it, by congressional district, is it possible it's just a push? I mean, the fact is, is that this is not gonna be definitive. Yeah, most people in the country will be asleep before the results come in from California. R right, but in terms of, I, I have to tell you one quick observation. Uh, in covering the delegation from, from the last convention, I have never seen a, a, any party's delegation with such acrimony between them. <laughs> it says the, the Bernie Sanders folks shut down the breakfast meeting every day. And it was a, um, a you know, it, it, was, it was astonishing. I'm wondering if that's gonna play out again today, but you had problems with it. You didn't see that in the Republican convention, that's for sure. Another question. Uh, Alex Michelson, by the way, he has a show 10.30 Friday night on Fox 11. I'm, he ha he's going to pay me to, because I promoted that. There is one uh, better show, which is on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. on Channel 4, <laughs> news conference yeah, by Conan Nolan. We're preempted this week a, by sports. A so. fantastic, well, because you're preempted, we're actually re-airing at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday morning, so those used to watching Conan should give us a try. That's all right. <laughs> uh, great job, as always. Uh, we all were excited uh, months ago about this concept that California is going to be matter and we're going to have all these rallies that Carla's talking about and it's so fun to see these candidates. But you were talking about this a little bit. Because of the schedule, because South Carolina is three days before us, because 10 states are voting the same day, because there's like two debates in the month, because there's an impeachment, are we going to see any of that? I mean, are there going to be maybe a rally here or there, but are we going to have like the candidates coming and have that actual finally campaign in California, or is that just not going to happen? I think they are, they're going to campaign here. They're just not going to live here. I mean, that's, uh, it's, it's going to be, you know, they're going to make judgments about what to do. But think about the logistics. South Carolina is going to have, there'll be, uh, you know, 9, 10 o'clock before you know the results there. So where are you going to go? You're going to go to North Carolina, which is on uh, March 3rd, which is, you know, like just up the road, or are you going to come to California? and burn the whole day but and right. night in the process. But you're not going to have the bus, you're not going to get the bus tour. No. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, last, last year at this no. time at this conference, we were saying, hey, maybe people are going to be camping out in California. It's not, it's not, happening. not happening. But they're still coming here for the money. We're still the ATM, and that's where, that's where they fly in and out for. And they're doing more, they're doing more events yes. around that fundraising schedule. <laughs> Just to cover. Not happening on our side. Donald Trump, I predict, will win the Republican primary <laughs> in California. More questions? Yes, ma'am, right there. You. No. Oh, okay. There it goes. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Manju. Just I want to give a little bit of context of why I'm here first. Uh, in California in 2014, 52% of students were registered, but only 8.2% actually voted. So um, we started our organization called the Band of Voters excuse me, a band of voters to turn out student voters, not just by registering them, but by educating them and then taking them to the polls. Um, on campuses like UCLA in 2018, we increased voter turnout by 537%. We also just recently drafted and passed a bill, um, AB 963, which is going to uh, impact 3.1 million students on 147 campuses. So we wanna keep doing this work um, in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, all of that, but, um, as a young activist in particular, I'm concerned that I'm not being reached out to. My generation is being left out. So my question to y'all is, um, how does any party or candidate expect to win without talking to us who make up 40% of the electorate? Good question. Good, very good question. Well, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. I spent a whole hell of a lot of my time trying to figure out how to find you guys and talk to you. And whether it's uh, online, digitally, or it's, uh, or it's, um, messaging or whatever you, you are if you feel left out don't because well you know we're all of the people that are in the campaign business spend a lot of time worrying about 
millennial voters, student voters. And I think uh, Jim will probably agree with this. The part of what happened in Orange County is the students in places like UC Irvine and Cal State Fullerton voted overwhelmingly Democratic. And, and the whole nature of those communities were heavily influenced by student vote. We've, it's, you know, Jim knows this, back in the days with uh, first Walter and then Lois Caps, UC Santa Barbara had a huge impact mm -hmm. on taking a previously hardcore red Republican district and turning it into a Democratic district. So it, it has had a profound impact here in California, and I, I think around the country too, the college communities tend to be very strongly democratic. Yeah, I mean, uh, Mindy Romero at the California Civic Engagement Project says this this segment of voters is is critically important. It, it was up uh, twelve percent in terms of turnout from uh, twenty twelve to twenty sixteen, and this is going to be a segment that these candidates have got to pay attention to, along with. Asian American and Latino voters here in California that can make or break the campaign. So it is very it is very critical, the youth vote here in California. And I also think it's the wild card. Um, we have assumptions about older voters, um, and if the youth vote turns out, it could throw the entire process on its head, and as a journalist, I love when that stuff happens, so please turn out. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, the woman there in the blue. I just wanted to point out um, what hasn't been mentioned is in 2016, by the time the primary came to California, the other candidates, Republican candidates, had dropped out, and California really didn't have a choice in the Republican primary. Good point. Every delegate was from, uh, and I, I found it fascinating that some of the delegates, the GOP delegates in Cleveland, had been delegates for George W. Bush. And I think, well, wait, you're, you're now excited about a guy who believes Bush was responsible for 9-11. They actually got a, a press credential for somebody who believed Bush planned 9-11. And so th to me, that was uh, baffling, but I'm sorry, that's just me. Yes, sir. You guys talked about the new system uh, perhaps being uh, difficult, challenging, and so on, but you didn't mention that there's actually some questions about certifying that process at this point because of some problems with the ballot itself. You got a chance to educate a large room full of people who have a lot of friends. Any, anything you want to say about that? I'm sorry, which system are you talking about? The LA, the, the, the new LA voter system. Well, it has yet to be certified. I don't know if that means it's not gonna be certified. Uh, my understanding is it's just in the process until we're told or we understand that there are serious problems. I mean, there could be. We have, uh, gosh, what now, three weeks until those those uh, systems go. But they've been testing them for a year. And finding flaws. And finding flaws, but that's why you test. Um, at this point, I un unless you, maybe you have some news to share with us, I, I, don't, I don't have an expectation that they won't be. because of the fact that uh, you have a list of candidates and then at the bottom you have more or next and people may very well get confused and not see the remaining candidates for that r office because they're only listing four on a page by hitting next, in which case they have no chance to go back. That's a problem. It is potentially a problem. But you it, know, these kinds of things always crop up when you have really, really long, even if it's a paper ballot. Um, there are candidates who have sued based on where their name was and the fact that you had to flip over a card. I don't know if that means that these systems are not are inherently flawed. What, what I do know is, and I'm not one of those Republicans who thinks voter fraud is the huge problem that some of my colleagues think it is, and unfortunately too many Democrats don't think voter fraud exists at all. And I'm telling you, it's somewhere in between. I mean, I, I bought a house in San Juan Capistrano, uh, two years ago registered to vote, and I'm one of two people registered to vote there. There's some fellow I don't know who's declined to state who, I got a postcard at my house. The more high tech we get, the greater the opportunity to dink with these systems. And when we, you know, all these fellows in Washington are complaining about Russia wanting to hack our system, and we're making our systems more 
hackable and we're not keeping the paper. Um, you know, we found, I like Alex Padilla, he's a friend of mine. Um, we found in Riverside County Republicans whose registration were changed. The DA investigated. We found out that you can't track back the Secretary of State's website to IP address. So the prosecutor couldn't figure out how it was there. I met with Alex, he said, well, you know, you have to have so much information in order to fraudulently register, we don't think it's a problem. I'm here to tell you it is a problem and probably good not to have as many paper ballots for the environment running around, but the more you allow digital, it's, 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 it's a problem. Just point and of fact, there is still, this is still a paper system. No, I understand that. Just so everyone doesn't think that we're getting rid of paper. It still produces a paper ballot. It's just the the interface system. Sure, but the right, but the but you're right. You're absolutely right. And in fact, it's uh, in uh, is it Seattle is conducting um, uh, digital voting, which we really seems to be a um, uh, a problem waiting to happen. So that'll be interesting to see how that turns out. We've run out of time, but Mike Murphy had a question over there. So and he's a sponsor of this. So. Right up on. Oh, thank you. Very stealthy. Uh, just quickly, because I think we like to believe that the California primary operates a bit independently, but I'd be curious what the panel thinks the odds are that whoever wins the California primary will not have already finished in the top two in South Carolina before California, or will he be an independent outcome? Oh, don't look at me. I'm not Carla? Your, your team. Not. You're up. I don't know what to say on that one, Mike. I think, I think it's likely, um, but as you said so well, who wants to predict anything anymore? Yeah, I have no uh, freaking idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll predict. I think it's Biden. I think Biden runs the runs you know runs the table. Mike, your question is: Will they be, will the winner here be uh, a top two finisher in South Carolina? If, if anybody from here who hasn't finished top two in South Carolina, uh, I, I I wouldn't think so. Uh, the Center for the Political Future is not just involved in exercises like this, but they're also helping students actually get uh, hands-on understanding of the political world uh, as it exists in the form of political campaigns. This center st sent out to Iowa to work on the uh, ill-fated Kamala Harris campaign, God bless her, but she had to drop out, and that of the great former mayor of South Bend, Pete Buttigieg, who, by the way, I had a niece who dated in South Bend. My family <laughs> says she flipped him, uh, but <laughs> big family in South Bend. But I'd like to introduce these two individuals who are going to come up and tell us a little bit about their experience. Everybody, big round of applause for Yoko Rosenbaum and Alon Landong. <laughs> 